Hi everyone and welcome to the Sparks Talks webinar series, all part of the latest Spark campaign brought, you, brought to you by the Girls Action Foundation. I am Elvira Trulia, the webinar and blog producer for the latest Spark campaign. And in a couple of minutes I will be passing the microphone on to attorney Alicia Natividad, who will be talking about the basics of creating contracts. And I, have, I would like to thank Alicia in advance for being with us today. I'm also happy to see some familiar names joining us for today's webinar. For those of you who are returning, welcome back to Sparks Talks. And for those of you who are new to this series, I wanted to briefly introduce you to the Girls Action Foundation before passing things on to Alicia. So very quickly, Girls Action Foundation is a national nonprofit that works to empower girls. And we're based in Montreal where we run local girls programs and we work with some 250 partners across the country who run their own girls programs. We also provide leadership training, organize networking events, and do many other things that connect girls and young women. And in terms of impact, nationally we reach around 60,000 girls and young women. They're located in remote communities, and marginalized and urban communities, as well as communities in the north. So, as I mentioned just a, a minute ago, this webinar series is presented as part of the Light a Spark campaign, and it's a campaign that showcases women role models across the country. And the role models, or what we call sparks, are involved in the campaign in, in different ways, including as webinar presenters. And in fact, Alicia Natividad is one one of our sparks in the uh, in the Light of Spark campaign. So just one more moment um, before um, I introduce Alicia, I'd like to go through what um, what we're, the agenda for today, as well as give you some insights into sort of the interactive features of the webinar. See on the uh, the right hand side of your screen uh, a number of panels or information displays, and and these will be changing throughout the presentation. If you if you look to your right now, you should see a Q and A window, and here is where you can ask questions and interact with Alicia, myself, and other participants. So if you have a question or a comment during the presentation please type it into the Q&A box, hit enter, and it will be recorded there. By default, the, the question will be visible to everyone, but if you do prefer to submit your question privately, click on the down arrow at the bottom of the Q&A box, select my name, Elvira Trulia, instead of all participants. That's, uh, in that way, a question will come directly to me. After Alicia speaks, We'll be opening up the, the Q&A period, and we'll be answering your questions. And as the moderator, I'll be keeping track of everything that has been asked in the Q&A uh, box and slowly direct, uh, direct them to Alicia during the Q&A period. I also want to let you know that today's session is being recorded, including the question period, and all of this will be posted online in the next few days. And I will be sending everyone a link to, to the recording. The last techno net note I wanted to, to share with you is that you, you may see a video panel um, on your um, screen to the right-hand side, and, and if you do, and you select uh, on Alicia, um, you should be able to see um, her image. Um, if, if it doesn't work for you, don't, don't worry. Um, this is a new technology, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, uh, but um, uh, be assured that, that Alicia is uh, is with us today, and in fact, I will be doing um, I will be introducing her in just a moment. So Alicia is a lawyer specializing in business law, estate and succession planning, and real property, and she runs her own private practice in Ottawa. Despite her busy schedule, she also she is also an active supporter of women's groups. Alicia was one of the founders and past president of the Ottawa Women's Network. She worked with Ottawa Carleton Immigrant Services Organization to set up a women's co-op. Alicia also worked to establish the Multicultural Council of Professional Women as an incorporated association and with Nelson House, a shelter for abused women and their children. She was there, its first legal counsel. Alicia also actively works with the Philippine community as legal counsel to various local organizations. She writes or speaks on numerous legal topics or provides pro bono legal services. She's received local recognition for her volunteer and leadership efforts in Ottawa. Nationally, she has received the Governor General's Golden Jubilee Medal and in, 19, in 2003, she received the title for Most Outstanding Filipino-Canadian. 
So with all that, it's my uh, pleasure to pass things over to Alicia. Welcome. Oh, and unfortunately, Alicia's line has Alicia's line has drawn, so she's not on the call. Um, let's see if I can get her back up. Okay, I do apologize to everyone. I, Alicia is here, but she is actually, her phone line has, seems to have gone down, so she's going to have to call back into the call. So what I would like to ask um, participants is if you can just bear with us for a moment as I try to um, communicate with Alicia in, in the other room and, um, and get her to, to get back onto the call. I do apologize for this. Alicia. I'm back. Okay. So here she is. <laughs> I just introduced you. I just introduced you. Um, All right. So um, thank you, everyone, um, for, uh, for your patience. So here is Alicia, and I'm passing things on to you. All right. Well, thank you, Elvira, and uh, thank you to Girl Action Foundation for this webinar series that it is presenting to everyone. It's, uh, I think, very helpful. And Elvira has been most patient, so I thank her for all of the uh, the uh, the past events that has gone through, and uh, hopefully there won't be any more technical difficulties. So um, there is a uh, a section of the webinar called polling, and if you would just click on that, uh, it actually gives there's certain questions, and uh, we it identifies for. Um, for us, who are the participants, where you're coming from, and so on. So if you would like to just take a few minutes to answer those questions, and then the results will be posted online. So you could see it it's, uh, says polling, and then there are six questions, if I'm correct, uh, just very simple questions. So if you would just take a few moments. And when you've done that, uh, the results will be shown. So we know exactly where the uh, the participants are. Are, um, are right now. This is a way for Alicia to, to know who's in the room, as she just mentioned, and, and also um, as you're asking the questions, it'll, it'll um, also help Alicia sort of address the questions based on based on your answers. But you can feel free to, to start your presentation, Alicia, uh, Alicia and um, people have a few minutes to, to fill out the, the questions. And once that's done, I'm going to actually be posting uh, the results uh, directly on your screen, so everyone's going to get to see um, who's in the room. And, and if you if you'd like, you could you can comment on. Um, on who's in the room um, as you go through your presentation. Okay. Um, oh, there's my picture. Let me just uh, click down here. You want to just uh, click on to, to your presentation. I was trying to do that. Let's see. Yeah. Click I'm going on, to start. On the, on the top, uh, on the top tab, on the top that says contracts presentation. Okay, here we are. So the topic for today is contracts, everything you want to know about contracts and how to uh, how make or break them. Um, as a qualifier, what I'd like to say is what I'm going to be speaking about are general legal principles. And these are legal principles that lawyers uh, ask whenever somebody says, you know, I have this contract or I have a dispute and so on. So we all, lawyers always say, well, you know, um, is it really a contract? And then they look at the, the various legal principles that, um, that that particular lawyer will have to deal with. And in doing so, it really depends on which uh, system of law you're in 
and uh, um, there are two systems in Canada. One is common law, which is for all of Canada except for Quebec. And civil law is, of course, um, in Quebec because of its uh, historical beginnings. And in Quebec, they have uh, the Quebec Civil Code. And the Quebec Civil Code is basically um, um, a, a code that um, governs all of the activities of people in Quebec. So if there is an issue, a lawyer would always say, well, you know, let's look at the code. What are the code provisions? And in addition to the code, of course, um, each fact, if they are tried in court, would have its own set of uh, principles arising from it, and that's how your body of law uh, arises. And then uh, for certain things that the province wants uh, to uh, legislate, then there is statute law. And those are things like, for example, that will help uh, uh, the people in that particular province. And generally, there would be consumer laws, there would be employment laws, and so on. For the rest of Canada, we are under a common law system. Um, and its historical beginnings are, of course, uh, based in England and the common law. And the body of law that uh, comprises contract law are really all those cases that have been adjudicated or gone to court and uh, on which legal principles have come out of. And uh, we talk about precedents because we have a system where, depending on the ranking of the courts, lawyers will say uh, that, you know, this is what is the law in Ontario based on this case. And usually the Court of Appeal of Ontario, as would the Court of Appeal of each of the provinces and territories, would be the final adjudicator. But if a matter goes to the Supreme Court of Canada, which governs uh, and rules on all laws across Canada, including Quebec, then the Supreme Court of Canada would be the final arbiter or the final that particular case that's been decided by the Supreme Court of Canada that would apply in all of Canada. So the other thing I want to say is because a lot of things, lawyers always say, you know, it depends, right? It depends on the facts. So it is true. It depends on each fact situation. So when you are uh, listening to me and extracting the legal principles, you know, don't try to um, to just superimpose, for example, your case or your particular fact situation because, you know, uh, there are always uh, every every fact, every Every situation is different, so facts make uh, whatever will arise from a particular situation. So that's why you hear lawyers saying, you know, it all depends. It all depends on the facts is really the end of that particular sentence. So having said that, um, let's now move on. What is the contract? Uh, um, and that is actually the essential question that every lawyer asks. You know, is this a contract? Because, and then you look at, is what are the ingredients constituting a contract? And I will go through that uh, throughout this presentation. But essentially, a contract is an agreement between two or more people that give rise to obligations uh, which are enforceable or recognized in law. And uh, the Quebec Civil Code, and it's in Division 2, actually says the same thing in different words. It just says that uh, a contract is an agreement of wills by which one or more persons obligate themselves to one or several other persons to perform a prestation or it's to perform something. So um, you could see that there is similarity. And an essential component of that is there must be an offer, meaning that I have to make an offer to somebody to create an agreement or a contract. And I distinguished that and I said, you know, it's different from what we would say, lawyers in the common law provinces, an invitation to treat. So what's an example of an invitation to treat? The most common one is really going to a store, and you see all these products and wares that are displayed. So most people will say that when you pick it up, you know, you've made a contract with that merchant, but that's not the case. It's an invitation to treat. What the merchant is saying is, here are all these wonderful products for you to buy, and uh, only when you pick it up, and you go through the cashier and pay for it, has a contract been made? Because you could put it back on the shelf, right, and not have made a contract. But what you're doing is you're looking around, pick up an object that you want, you go to the teller or whoever is the cashier, and then you say, I want to buy this. So you're making an offer to buy. 
and the cashier when she, when he or she takes it and swipes it and you know and you pay for it accepts your offer and then when payment is made and you take the product with you out of the store that is when a contract is made the same kind of scenario you know for an auctioneer you know people will say that oh when you put the placard up your uh and the engineer is going, spewing out uh, all of the uh, the amounts and products you could buy that you made a contract. But again, that's not the case. So when the auctioneer is rhyming off what products being sold and the amounts and so on, and you put up your little placard, you're making an offer to buy that on the price that is being auctioned. And then when the auctioneer hits the gavel, that is when your contract is made. That means he has accepted your offer, he or she has accepted your offer, and when you pay for that particular product, then your contract is finally binding. So that is what is meant by making an offer. There must be an offer as opposed to just an invitation to treat. And the same concept applies for uh, tenders. You know, those are invitation to treats. And then it's tenders alone have their own um, uh, areas uh, for the making of contracts and so on. The next uh, item is that if you've made an offer to somebody, that person must accept it. And uh, acceptance cannot be silent, uh, and you, the person who is accepting your offer must communicate it to you. So there must be something that that person must do expressly or impliedly, but generally the, to be clear, an acceptance must be clear and unequivocal, meaning that there can't be any guessing that your offer was not accepted or that uh, that person did not accept your offer, because it's very important. Uh, if that person may have changed their mind, then it may be too late if the offer has already been communicated. The other thing is that uh, the acceptance must be within a, a period of time. And, you know, is there a period of time that the offer is valid for? Say, for example, you say, okay, my offer to you to accept this amount of money is only open until 11.59 tonight. And if you don't accept it, then the offer is gone. It's off the table. So the person accepting must accept that offer no later than 11.59 p.m. that particular night. So it has to be exactly uh, the way that the offer was phrased. So it's an offer, it's open for a limited time, and you have to accept it within that limited period of time. The third ingredient is that uh, common law lawyers always say there must be consideration. What is consideration? It's something that uh, flows from one party to the other. So there must be some benefit to the pers to one person and a detriment or something negative to the other person. It can be money, but it doesn't have to be money. It can be something that is lost, that someone loses and somebody gains. And it must be in the context of that offer and acceptance. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has said that a seal is good consideration because uh, historically uh, documents, agreements were sealed. In the old days, uh, you would see the sealing of uh, parties and there are you know, seals that are our keys or signets or whatever, particular houses and so on. So the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized that, yes, you know, uh, there may not be this detriment and benefit flowing, but if it's sealed, then it must, you know, the parties must have intended for uh, this contract to be valid without the detriment or uh, benefit flowing, without cash being given or whatever. So. It's, uh, I always say it's still good law, and when there's, I, when there's a question as to whether there is that consideration, I always make sure that there's a seal. And what do I use for a seal? Really, the uh, dying Durham and legal stationers used to make those seals, but now I just use a, uh, a red, a red uh, dot or whatever. I like red, and red is used, generally seen to be uh, the colors for seal. So this item is there must be certainty and finality and uh, certainty so that both the parties or all of the parties know exactly what uh, is being offered, what is being accepted, and uh, what obligations and what are the terms, right? So certainty, if it's in, in, uh, in written form, if you have a written contract, the, the words must be clear. It 
must be, as we say, clear and unequivocal. And, you know, if you take the ordinary meaning of it, uh, if one were to read it, or if, what, if a reasonable person on the street were to ask, then uh, that particular person must say, oh, it's clear to me that this is what, you, what you've said. And there must be finality. So, for example, uh, contracts that have conditions attached to them, you know, like say, for example, um, agreements for the sale of land, sometimes would have conditions that say that the contract is conditional on the buyer doing a home inspection, on the buyer getting financing, on the buyer um, um, doing a, uh, a, a checkup on the, the well or the septic system. Those are all conditions, and they're all conditions for the benefit of the buyer. So it renders the agreement uh, uncertain because until the buyer uh, removes the condition, then the agreement is not final and binding. So another example would be in an employment contract context where the employer will say that um, you know you have to be uh, terminated from your previous employment before we can hire you. You know that's definitely an, a, a condition that uh, must be done. And then of course there are in law there are two kinds of conditions that we talk about. Uh, there are conditions precedent similar to the buyer seller of land that I talked about, or um, conditions that are really out of your control. You know, for example, a good example is if a third party, like um, a community, a, the government, were to give you funding for this particular project, and if that funding is not uh, given, then, of course, that is something out of your control. And that is a condition that uh, will render your contract um, terminated. And lastly, but very importantly, is that the parties must intend to make a contract. So. Intention is very important, and when the courts are reviewing uh, a contract that is in dispute, they're always saying, the courts are always questioning, what is the intention of the parties? What were the parties thinking of when they made this agreement? And that is when you look at uh, what is in writing, what is, what is the evidence, and evidence is very, very important when you are uh, in a contract dispute, because that determines or shows what may be the intention of the parties. And if you go to court and you have an oral contract, it becomes a he says, she says. It's all in credibility and it's all on uh, what one party says and who is more credible, but also what evidence one party can show the court that he or she intended the contract or that the parties intended the contract to be. So going on to the next screen, um, is who can what uh, who can contract? Uh, let me just see. It's uh, coming up, but in this particular screen, it doesn't seem to want to uh, go forward. There it is. Who can contract? So the parties to a contract are important uh, because a they create what we call privity of contract, and privity of contract means that these are the parties bound by the contract, but also um, who can sue on that contract, who can enforce that contract, who uh, will take the benefit of that contract. So who can contract or parties are very important. And for individuals, it's always uh, an individual who has reached the age of majority, whatever that is in any province, generally 18 years of age, the same in Quebec. Competent, meaning that that, that person must have the ability, the facility, mental uh, facility, to understand what they are getting into, essentially understanding the legal obligations, the legal risk, and so that is what competency means. Uh, it could also go, is one of the conditions uh, to the contract, that you're able to do the work. But in this context, what um, is really meant is that it's the ability for a person to understand the legal nature and effect of what is being um, obligated on that person or what benefit will arise uh, to that person. Um, if the age of majority, if a person is under the age of majority, you know, can minors who are less than 18 years of age, can they be contract, uh, parties to a contract? And the answer is yes. 
And what will bind the miners are contracts uh, for the necessities of life. That's what that's a phraseology that's uh, used in law. Necessities of life would be housing, um, medical, and so on. So things that is necessary for a person to live. Um, the flip side of that is that uh, you can bind a miner to uh, a contract for the necessity of life, but if, say, for example, you sell land to a miner, that's, you know, the question is, is that land, because it has a house, is that necessary for that person? Or is, is it not necessary? A vacant land, for example, is, that, uh, is different from a land with a house. And so the, the issue is, you know, is that a necessity of life, the purchase of that contract? But my point is, if it is not for the necessities of life, then a minor can actually not be obligated to follow through with that contract. But the person who uh, is on the other end may be because um, that person, so long as that person is not of legal age. So what will bind uh, a minor, a contract that is only for uh, the necessities of life for that particular minor? Um, and can a minor enter into other contracts? Yes, they can, but if it's not for the necessities of life, then that minor doesn't can run away from that contract is the most colloquial way of saying it. So other, other than individuals, uh, there are, of course, entities, incorporated entities, such as foundations. Those are recognized in law. They're incorporated, cooperatives, anything that the law recognizes. Partnerships, uh, limited liability partnerships, those are some of the things. Uh, trusts, uh, but it will be the trustees who will be the parties to the contract. So, for example, if you, some of you may have a trust, you know, let's say um, my name, uh, Ast uh, well, let's, let, let's say Trulia, uh, Elvira Trust, okay? So the trust itself, when it's entered into a contract, cannot uh, put that name, but it's the trustees of that trust that will be bound or that can make the contract. So there are rules as to um, how, who may contract on behalf of that entity. The same goes for partnerships. You know, there are a lot of law firms, accounting firms that may still be on a partnership. So who, are, who, cannot, who can contract would be all of the partners of that partnership. Uh, in a limited liability partnership, they're able to say one. So uh, just, you know, you have to be vigilant about that. The other thing I want to say is that, and this will be on later, but I may as well say it now, it's very important to put the correct name, particularly for entities. Um, there is case law in Ontario that says that um, this particular numbered company, um, you know, it ended with an INC, Inc. Well, uh, a contract was made, but, you know, someone was not careful and, and put LTD. And if you search for that company, it won't show up because it has an INC ending. So that particular case said, well, there was no contract because whoever that corporate entity is did not exist, and that is true. So be very careful. I always check. Uh, I mean, there are ways of checking uh, the, um, the names of uh, entities, particularly corporations. Uh, you know, you do business name search uh, across the province, and I think that the same thing holds true in Quebec. I just want to say in Quebec, you know, minors, my contract, there's actually a section for minors in the Quebec Civil Code. And interestingly, you know, it says here that a minor, um, 14 years of age, is deemed to be a full age for all acts pertaining to his employment or to his practice of his craft or profession. If you're hiring minors in Quebec who are 14 years of age, uh, they are allowed, you are allowed, and uh, they can contract with you. Uh, there's no such provision in the common law, um, uh, you know, provinces. I mean, we don't have, you may look at the Employment Standards Act as to employment of minors, for example, or students, right, as to what is payable to them. But And there, there is a body of law that uh, determines, you know, can a person under the age, or at what age uh, can a minor appreciate uh, the full legal effects and there, you have to look at a number of cases to see which one flows or applies in the case. 
So the next item is what are types of contracts. And I put this on because in, in the Quebec Civil Code, you know, it actually lists uh, you know, the types of contracts. Um, they're pretty much the same in the uh, common law provinces. It's just terminology is, uh, is different. So I'll go through this and uh, match what are the types of contracts that you may see in uh, common law provinces. So in the Quebec Civil Code, and uh, what's nice about the Civil Code is that, you know, they do provide definitions. Contracts of adhesion and it speaks for itself. It's really non-negotiable contracts. So those are contracts that's drawn up by one party, and uh, you either accept or reject it. And a common example of that would be car rental agreements, you know, all those uh, or lease rental agreements uh, for cars or whatever. They're, most of the contract terms are non-negotiable. If you are going to change any of those, I always tell my clients, you know, don't rely on the person that uh, sold you this product and say, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we'll change that. We'll put it down here because it never happens. In the end, when it's litigated, it's always what what is on that contract. And usually because it's so non-negotiable, courts will lean towards the person who's disputing it rather than the person who has made this non-negotiable contract to uh, to determine, um, you know, the issue. So there, there is that uh, preferential treatment to the other side because it's non-negotiable. Generally, most contracts are by mutual agreement, meaning that, you know, both parties uh, talk about it, negotiate it to arrive at what are the final terms. Uh, bilateral contracts, uh, that is when both parties will perform certain things uh, as opposed to what is called a unilateral contract. And an example of a unilateral contract where only one party will perform is an award. You know, say for example, you have a reward. Uh, I'm going to pay you X number of dollars if you get me this, or if you uh, bring so and so to uh, to justice. Uh, so only the person who performs it and does it within the terms of that particular award or reward is the person uh, that has performed. And uh, and then the contract uh, ends when payment is made based on what was offered. And you have contracts that say uh, onerous just to meaning that there are responsibilities attached to the contract as opposed to gratuitous. And the question always is, you know, was it gratuitous? Did you intend for this person to have this object or to do for for you to do this thing without payment? Uh, and that's what gratuitous means. Uh, commutative, uh, uh, it just means that there is a mutual giving and receiving, such as in the uh, the contract for sale of land that I spoke about. You know, the person pays and gets the land uh, that includes the building. So moving on to what are the types of contracts that are there. The next object. Um, so the one object, uh, one of the slides that it didn't come up, but it's basically how can a contract be made? And generally, contracts are made uh, either orally or in writing. And I would say that uh, most contracts are made orally unless it is required, such as in land, for example. Uh, land in uh, the common law provinces must be in writing uh, under the statute of frauds, so although there is a case in Ontario where uh, the it was part performance and part in writing. So the question now is, you know, is does that mean that you can have a contract that is partly in writing and partly, uh, partly not by performance? But I think in general, even in Quebec, uh, that is the case. I have a little bit of difficulty I'm with gonna, the I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna help presentation. You with the, uh, I'm going to help you with so, that, uh, Alicia. I'm going to okay. take it back. I think we were, we were here. So I'm just while uh, oh so we're still going back to the other kinds of contracts. Uh, I mentioned there is commutative mutual giving, and the flip side to that is aleatory, and that's like an insurance contract, meaning that there's performance only upon the happening of an event. So your insurance company will pay you if, say, you experience a disaster. If you um, one of the things there is a flood in your basement or whatever those coverages that you have 
hadocrit. So that's a, a mouthful, the aleatory. We don't. <laughs> I think most people would understand its performance upon the happening of an event. And then their contracts were, you know, you have contracts of instantaneous performance or successive performance. And I think that speaks for itself. So instantaneous performance means, um, you know, you have to perform in order for you to um, to to uh, to feel your part of the bargain. Or there could be successive performance. For example, the phasing. Um, you know, in construction contracts, for example, payments are made in stages of construction. So as the windows and doors are put up, stage one, get paid, that's part of a contract. When the house is fully built, then all of the um, the entire contract has been done. And then, as I said, consumer contracts are um, there is a body of law uh, applying to that. But same time, statutorily, to protect uh, the um, the the persons in each of the provinces, a lot of provinces have their own consumer contracts. The same uh, holds true for employment standards. You know, they have employment standards that apply uh, to. Uh, employment of the individuals in that particular uh, um, jurisdiction, and then the across Canada there are ju there is uh, activities there are activities that are under the um, the labor code, and uh, because they run across the province, and so they affect more than just one t particular province. And as you know, um, Canada is a federation, so each province and territory has its own set of laws. But there are activities such as trucking, busing, railroad, and so on that go across the uh, go across Canada. And so the, uh, there is one, the uh, labor code is what will determine what are the rules applicable to that. Um, so going through all that then, we, what are the essential components of a contract? We talked about parties, who are they? They must have capacity, they must be competent, they must be named correctly. We talked about the consideration that must be some right or benefit or interest or profit that will flow to one party to the detriment of the other. Uh, a seal is still good consideration. So now I talked about intention and uh, so on. So the issue then is, you know, what is the purpose of this contract? Uh, why are the parties entering into this contract? And uh, for that, you know, you have to say the purpose must be lawful meaning that it can't be an unlawful process. So, for example, euthanasia, um, helping someone with assisted uh, death, is, is unlawful in Canada under the criminal code. So that is not a lawful purpose for which a contract would be upheld or um, a contract to shoot someone, for example. That is not lawful. So it must be lawful and it can't be contrary to uh, public order, as they say in Quebec, or, you know, or contrary to public policy and considerations. So um, your purpose, uh, even though you may have an offer acceptance and considerations of, and so on, must still be lawful for the reasons that I've said. And then the rights and obligations of each of the contracting parties, uh, um, these are what flows to each of the parties, these are what lawyers say, you know, these are the terms of the contract. And terms of the contract, uh, if they are in writing, are expressed terms. And if they're not in writing, and somebody says, but it's implied in that. So uh, if I say, I will make you a dress, well, it's implied in that because I said, I will make the dress, that it will be me who will sew the dress. So that is an implied presumption that the other party is making. And uh, again, you know, the test is for implied things, um, what is the reasonable person to think about that? Uh, I know that there are some discussions, you know, it's an implied contract or implied contracts. I think uh, all I could say to that is it falls under what I've just said. Either contracts are expressly written, expressly stated, or and it's very difficult for oral contracts because, as I said, it becomes a determination of uh, what evidence can one party show to the court that, in actual fact, that is what you have agreed to, that you say is express, that nobody can dispute. Um, oral contracts, um, my advice to people who are doing contracts orally is uh, 
put it down into writing, and uh, whether or not it's a chain of email, a chain of something, um, some some documentation, because then, as I said, the courts will have to look at the behavior of the parties. You know, what did you do uh, because you thought that you had this oral contract for employment, for example? Did you come to the office? Did you do this work? Was it your understanding that you're going to be paid? If so, then how much and so on. And that's where employment standards legislation come into fore because they, uh, those kind of legislation that uh, help consumers and people to fill in the gaps if uh, the formalities are not, uh, are not there. Um, the term of the contract is important. Uh, um, you know, so how long um, does a person have to perform this contract? Um, the same way that it's uh, important for you to identify how, you know, until what date is your offer good for, uh, or when is it time for this other person to accept. So uh, the period of time is very important. And you'll see very often, you know, uh, time is of the essence. What that means is that the time specified in your contract must be respected. So if you say that we have to close this deal today, you can't just close it tomorrow and say, oh, I thought it was tomorrow, if you can point to something that says that it has to be done by today. So that is where that term, time is of the essence, is very important. Um, the governing law is important as well, and that's why I highlighted for you the two different systems. But also if you are, say, doing uh, a consulting contract outside of Canada. And if that's the case, I always say you have to determine in writing what laws will apply. Uh, for example, uh, if I'm going to do some consulting work in New York and the other parties in New York, then um, I want it to be here in Ontario, particularly in Ottawa, where I am, because it's much more beneficial to me. I'm doing the work here, and so I want my laws to apply. The same thing even just going from province to province. If one party will say, um, you know, you're doing a contract in Quebec, and the other party says, you know, the Quebec laws will apply. Well, you know, you'll say, well, are those laws the same as mine? You know, that's those are uh, issues that you want to look at. Will I be better off if I do the contract there? You know, what is the disadvantage to me? What are the advantages to me? And um, language in Quebec is very important in a contract. So if parties want the contract in English, you have to have an express provision to say that, in fact, the parties want to contract um, in, in English and, and put it also in French. Um, so generally, if a contract is valid in one in one province, uh, then the validity of it may also depend on the other province, but generally, if validly made and accepted as being valid in the other provinces, then it's valid. But don't ever forget about this provision for any, any contract that you make with somebody in Quebec. Yeah. Some of the things that uh, should also be thought about in making your contract is, um, can a contract be assigned by any party? Um, you know, it's a negotiable item because, for example, contracts for service or performance, you know, personal services, uh, generally uh, may not be conducive to an assignment. So, for example, uh, my client will want me to do the work, and uh, I will have to ask my client permission if I'm going to ask another lawyer in another jurisdiction to do the work. And if I assign, and so is that uh, an assignment with consent? Did my client assign? And the same thing for contracts. And there, you don't necessarily have to assign all of the terms of the contract. You can assign part of the contract. But the point is, if there is thought, if there is an intention that part of that contract would be performed by somebody else, that means it's a subcontract. It could be a subcontract. I'm just saying that it uh, then that must be addressed in the negotiations of the parties. So as I say in the second bullet, what are the rights of the parties if a contract is assigned? You know, so for example, if I subcontract work to somebody, um, what are the rights? Uh, what are my who pays? For example, that subcontractor, do I pay, 
or does the initial person um, make the payment directly, and how will that affect the entire payment to be made under that contract? So these are all questions that arise. Some of it is process, but process make up the terms of the contract. So uh, be very clear on the process. The same thing for amendments. Um, amendments generally can only be done with the mutual consent of both parties. And if one, say for example, we make a contract and you say, you know, I want to change uh, this particular provision instead of paying you monthly and I want to pay you uh, quarterly because it's a lot easier and so on. Well, you know, you have to think, what is the benefit to me of doing this and, and, and so on. But you don't have to agree because the contract, the initial contract was made for certain things, and so um, if that is not the way it's going to be and you don't want to change it, then you don't have to change it. If you're going to agree to it, then if you have, uh, I always say put it in writing, and definitely for written contracts, uh, especially for land, uh, or for things that are mandated to be in writing, it has to be in writing. <coughs> so when a contract is being changed, then I always say, I look at the contract, if there is a contract, and I say, well, you know, what, uh, what does the contract say about that? Uh, as I say, it has to be mutual. Um, so we talked about assignment amendment, and now we're coming into, and I put this on because you see it in a lot of contracts, and people don't, they don't know how to spell it, and they don't know what it is. So all it means is that, and it, again, these are negotiable items. Who does the contract bind if, say, for example, you die or you become bankrupt or if it's a company you amalgamate with another company or your company is dissolved? So inurement just means um, will the contract bind, if you're an individual, your heirs, that means people that are allowed to benefit from your estate if you die, your personal representatives, for example, the attorneys, uh, these are attorneys under uh, powers of attorneys, for example, uh, successors and assigns apply to other entities other than individuals, uh, such as corporations. And if so, you know, what are the effects of it? So the Quebec Civil Code uh, has this particular provision on um, the rights and obligations passing to heirs, if so agreed. Same thing that I said. You know, you can determine whether or not it would. So contracts for performance, for example, are very difficult to bind your heirs uh, for performance, but certainly if there is payment, then it will bind your, uh, the, it will uh, be a benefit to your heirs, and your heirs can then ask the other contracting party who is to pay uh, the benefit of that payment. And the same thing, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I'm, I'm buying this piece of land, what if I die? Well, your heirs benefit to it. You know, and there's uh, an express provision that it will flow. The If the contract is, uh, you know, state so it's in writing, then your estate can still um, sue for, if you're selling land, for the uh, the sale price, but you have to go through the contract. That means that you have to follow through and perform the contract. So it has a dual benefit and disadvantage in the sense that the contract must be performed by the successive parties. So. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second, Alicia, just to, to thank participants for, for staying on the call and, and also to note, um, to ask participants if you'd be willing to stay for five extra minutes at the end because we, we started a little bit late and then we had some tech issues. Um, so we will be ending the webinar at 1.05 instead of at 1 p.m. Uh, but in the meantime, Alicia, I'm going to um, pass it back to you and ask if you can uh, spend maybe yeah. the last cu two more minutes to, to okay. wrap things up because questions are starting to come in and I want to make sure that people have a chance to, to have their questions addressed. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, that's fine. I, um, you know, I, I see the time is running. So termination is the end of a contract and contracts, you have to uh, specify how to end a contract. You know, when will the contract end, as I said, for um, a a consultant, you know, there's a certain time period. For employees, it's when you are terminated uh, and uh, for generally for things to be done. So 
address the issue of uh, when will a contract end, what is the process, uh, what are the consequences of terminating a contract, and what, co what terms will survive the closing, for example, or the ending. Uh, usually in employment law contracts or in commercial contracts where there are so, there is confidential information that you don't want to be divulged, you may ask for that. Um, or in employment terms, uh, non-competition, you can't compete with my uh, competitor or you can't solicit my competitor. Uh, the execution of a contract is um, my last slide. And I put that because I, you know, it's the question always is, is um, how do you prove, uh, or who, who are the are the parties uh, that are within the con, who are the parties, and if so, did they sign the contract? And it's evidence of your agreement to the terms. So that is a visual evidence of it. Nowadays, uh, you know, with uh, what I would call unilateral contracts. Um, an internet, for example, you know, they ask for a declaration if you are clicking onto their website. You have to agree to my terms in order for you to access X. Well, that Xing is no longer what we normally thought of as signing a contract. By the same token, we used to seal documents, and uh, all the, and that practice is long gone. And the the signing part became uh, important. And now we're willing to allow the clicking of it. And you could also sign in counterparts. You see that often in contracts. What that means is that either party can sign it, and the two documents or whatever doc, how many parties have signed will constitute one contract. So those are ways of doing it. And then now with emails, you know, you see the signature. And that is, again, a printed type of uh, signature that is not in the normal course. But the issue, that, the issue to be addressed is, how do uh, was the was the agreement evidence in writing? Is it required to be evidence in writing, and how is it done, and so on? Um, there are numerous resources online, but I, I told uh, Elvira that really I, I dissuade you from copying uh, precedents that you find online because sometimes they may not apply. And I find when I'm reviewing contracts, commercial contracts in particular, they look to the U.S. My, you know, and then they'll copy this particular contract, and it's got um, U.S. terminology, but U.S. laws because they're thinking whoever drafted is thinking U.S. laws. And so, my I urge you, please don't do that. And you know, spend uh, money, even if you draft something, you know, have your lawyer review it, have a lawyer review it or spend the money to, to have it done just so that it's uh, within, it, it would be at least a good starter in determining whether or not you have a valid contract. And the, the ones that I like, you know, of course, these are all, the Quebec Civil Code is online. It's easy for you to look at it. It's in French and English. Um, and the, these are all textbooks. And uh, you could go online to Canli, C-A-N-L-I-I, and those are a body of case law. That uh, of all, not all the cases are there, but there are some. And if you click on uh, terminology, say for example, you want to know consideration. What is it? You know, what are cases that deal with it can help you? You put that in a slot, and you will see cases. So it gives you ideas. It, it's you know, it's a frame and so on. But um, please don't um, please don't use those precedents unwittingly without thought and uh, tailoring it to your particular. Uh, uh, situation. So Thank on you. that note, uh, Thank you. Thank you for that, Alicia. I wanted, I wanted to just uh, jump in um, to, again, remind participants that we're going to be staying on a little bit longer to, to have a little bit more time to, to answer some questions. And, and the first thing I wanted to, to uh, maybe uh, draw your attention to is the polling results. Is, I don't know if you had a chance to look at them yet, uh, Alicia, but I noticed that um, half the people, uh, more or less half the people that that are that are on uh, are in the for-profit sector. The other half are in the non-profit, and uh, we actually don't have any employers um, participating mm. in the session. They are um, employees uh, working for organizations, or the majority um, are, seem to be self-employed. Uh, of course, based on the people who who um, answered the question and. And if you look at the question um, in terms of where people get their legal information, um, you were just talking about online information, and you know four of uh, the ten people who responded actually um, get their information online. So I know I, th I think it would be interesting maybe to expand a little bit more in, in terms of the online um, information. 
um, especially uh, as you mentioned during your presentation, that we, you know, in the age of new media, we do sign electronic con contracts all the time when we download software, when we do backing, and in multiple other places. Um, so I suppose my my intro question to you would be, you know, what what can we do to uh, what do we need to know about electronic uh, contracts, and and what can we do? as consumers and, and, and um, users of online information to protect ourselves? You know, my best advice is to spend the money <clears throat> to get a, a form contract for your, you know, for your organization. It really saves you, especially, you know, contract employments and so on, or specific contracts. Um, contracts with, you know, when you get funding and so on from the government, I mean, they, they have their own contracts, and most of the time they're not negotiable. Um, but certainly, you know, for small organizations, and uh, I, I really dissuade on them. I tell you, uh, or, or if you're going to do it, you know, do it uh, in writing using very simple languages and addressing the issues that I've dealt with. Uh, and um, I, I don't, re you know, really I don't. Uh, please don't do it. And it's my advice to you, spend the money, um, to find a good lawyer that can help you tailor uh, your employment contracts to um, what your organization can use. So. Okay, so I know it's not. <laughs> it's not well, um, I'm I'm gonna also um, a few people have written in and relating to employee employment questions, and um, Taylor um, wrote in, I'm self-employed. Often a client will need me to confirm for a project in a short amount of time, if I confirm, even though neither of us has signed a contract, and then I found out that their terms are unacceptable. Can I turn down the job without breaching, without breaching contract, um, being in yeah, breach I of contract? Taylor's, right. No, I see Taylor's question. You know, Taylor, as I said, you know, a chain of email can determine whether or not a, or not a contract has been made. So I guess the issue always is, is what are the terms of the contract, right? So it may be that uh, I will say, Taylor, you know, can you work for me? And you'll say yes. But I didn't tell you what are the terms of that contract, right? So uh, when I, so we're just starting the negotiation is my point. So if I were you, I would always say, you know, yes, uh, I would be happy to work for you, but what are the terms of uh, the services I'm supposed to render, right? So without answering your question, because I really don't know the, uh, all of the fact situation, I haven't seen what details uh, there are there. Um, as I say, if you've just agreed to do something but you don't know what are the terms and the terms are not acceptable for X, Y, and Z, then you have to communicate that and say, I can't do the work. And uh, so the issue of breaches is, is always a fact situation. So who breached what? But the other issue is, has a contract been made? Were all the terms identified at the beginning? You know, there may have been an offer made and you've accepted, but what are the terms of the contract? You know, so you have to go through all of the essential ingredients that make up a contract to determine if, in fact, a contract has been made. But if the terms are not there. How do you know, right? And what did, what did you contract for? So to ask a lot of questions. Uh, well, basically, so, yes, they, so but it's clear what you're, you're uh, the term, what you're contracting. Yes. A similar question from uh, uh, Danielle Lee, and uh, Danielle says, "Hello, I recently had to sign a contract with an employer. It was favored towards the employer, and they told me uh, nothing was negotiable. Uh, what are my rights in um, in this case? Uh, do I have no choice but to sign the contract according to the employer's terms?" Uh, so, um, sort of a variation. Generally, you know. Um, and I don't know what position there is, but um, generally there is a, uh, employers are encouraged to have their employees sign contracts. And uh, most of the time you have no choice, right? If you want a job, then you do it. But if, if you don't like any of those terms, then your choice is really not to, to proceed with that particular contract. The issue comes uh, back when um, you work and then you one of the contract is uh, one of the terms become unacceptable to you, like, for example, the hours of work. And then you say, oh, well, you know, I don't like that uh, because it's not working for me and so on. You had signed on to it, and then it, depending on the term, the question is, at that particular time, you know, should you have gotten independent legal advice and so on. But 
if the employer basically said it's not negotiable, you know, take it or leave it, it's an employment contract, then uh, depending on what are the terms and you sign on to it, then you have signed on to it and you have performed. Um, can you change it afterwards? There are rules, depending on what province you are, as to uh, whether or not you can. Like, for example, um, the hour, you know, basically what you're doing is you're changing the contract. So if you're amending the contract, it has to be mutual. So the employer and empl employee must agree. And if the contract is changed, then you put it in writing to document that, in fact, those, you know, those particular terms were, uh, were changed and altered. Of uh, course, the ideal would, situation would be to be able to negotiate and uh, to be able to have terms that are favorable for both the employer and, and, and the employee. And maybe the, the issue comes up when when something changes, when those terms are no longer acceptable. What, what, what's the recourse, let's say, for an employee um, if they've signed on to something but they, they find that it's unacceptable? Um, you know, Basically, you what you're looking at is you're looking at ending the employment contract. And then depending on the your years of work, the type of work you're doing, um, the Employment Standards Act in every, leg, in every province will determine how to give reasonable notice. You have to give reasonable notice to your employee, employer if you can't renegotiate and change those terms. So essentially, a, you either uh, change the terms, and negotiate that with your employer, and the employer must agree. Or if you can't live with it uh, and you want to end the contract, you have to give notice of ending your employment contract with your employer. And to give reasonable notice, uh, for example, in Ontario, um, the Employment Standards Act says that you have to give uh, at least a week's notice, you know, uh, if you've worked for at least three months, uh, and an employer must at the same time. They've set minimum standards. And the same holds true for every province. If you are a consultant uh, or an independent contractor, the law still says you have to give reasonable notice. So it means that you can't just, um, you know, yesterday say, I'm not coming to work today, and just not, and abrupt the, um, the relationship. You have to give notice. So. And the notice is determined either by your contract, if there is one in writing, or by the minimum standards set by the employment standards for each province. I'm going to so, throw one, you know, more, one more question yeah. to you um, before we close things. Cecilia was also um, asking a question very unrelated to, to the other ones. Could you explain, again, when a minor can get into a contract? I think you mentioned necessity, necessities of life. Can you give some examples? Um, I, that uh, piqued curios curiosity. <laughs> okay, sure. You know, minors, uh, as I said, necessities of life. And that the question then is, for that minor, what is the necessities of life uh, for them? Uh, it includes buying clothes, for example. Uh, you know, if that person uh, needs clothes, uh, because that's part of living, right? Uh, food, uh, buying groceries, um, renting. Uh, a room, for example, or renting an apartment. Uh, these are your basic necessities. So, so it can't be if that person already has uh, a dwelling, then renting a second house, for example, is not a necessity of life. So. Does okay, that answer the question? I think I think so. And, and you know, I I do want to I do have to close this off, yeah, um, I but I, I do want. To, to let people know that um, the, your PowerPoint will be available, um, the whole presentation will be available online in, in, the next, in the coming days. So I will make sure to send everyone a link to that. And, and uh, Alicia, if you, if you would like to share your perhaps your email address, or if people want to contact me, and then I could relay additional questions to you, then we could do that as well. Um, there's just one point of clarification before. Um, before we end uh, today's webinar, and uh, Forte Gerardo was asking uh, whether or not he heard correctly that clicking on the I agree button in, in, on websites is no longer valid. And I, I don't think that that's what you were saying, Alicia. But I'll, I'll no, ask. actually, I, it, it all you know, it, there, it's like consumer contracts. Uh, um, the law says you know by clicking on it, did you was there a contract that was made? And like a consumer contract, it's always. Um, uh, 
reviewed or looked upon as being more biased to the other party. And a lot of people say, well, I don't even understand it. And if I don't understand it, then it's it's no longer valid. So um, the question is, it depends. And uh, there have been cases that says that that is an acceptance. You know, by clicking on it, it's an acceptance. So, but uh, let's look at it again. I may be wrong. So I'll get back to 40. <laughs> I guess. Okay. So thank you so much, um, Alicia, uh, for the very detailed presentation. And I think that we can go on for another two hours with multiple questions. More, 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 more. And um, uh, quite, quite a few um, uh, popped into my head as you, as you were going through the presentation. But unfortunately, uh, time um, has come to an end. So I want to thank you very much. And also to, by, to wrap things up and uh, to remind people that this webinar series is being presented as part of the latest Spark campaign uh, brought to you by the Girls Action Foundation. And if you would like some more information about that campaign, I encourage you to check out our website, girlsactionfoundation.ca, and click on Latest Spark. And there you will uh, find quite a bit more information about the campaign, as well as some information about upcoming as such as um, upcoming webinars, and actually the next one is mid-December, December 15th, on a very different subject. Um, Chief Kim Baird will be talking about self-government lessons in building sustainable community. So I thank you um, very much to everyone on, on today's uh, participating in today's webinar, and a special thanks to you, Alicia, and have a great day. Thank you, Elvira.